Hello, everyone. We have a speaker um, who is not a psychiatrist. <laughs> and oh, but I feel so comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Ernest Weimuller was born in New York City. He graduated from Dartmouth and Harvard Medical School. After completing surgical internship at Vanderbilt, he served as captain in uh, the USAF Medical Corps and then completed otolaryngology training at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. He began his postgraduate career in 73 with Boston Ear, Nose, and Throat Associates and also served as Associate Director of the Head and Neck Tumor Clinic at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. He returned to academic medicine in 78 with an appointment as an assistant professor at the University of Washington, became professor and vice chairman in 85, and chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery from 92 to 2008. He has over 100 publications in peer-reviewed journals, has co-authored two surgical atlases, contributed 30 chapters to various textbooks, and serves on numerous editorial review boards. Uh, his major areas of academic focus have been the development and testing of the University of Washington Head and Neck Quality of Life Instrument and the establishment of an international head and neck cancer database. Uh, national activities have included president of the American Head and Neck Society, vice president of the Western section of the Triological Society, edit editor historian of the American Laryngological, Laryngological Society, and senior examiner of the American Board of Otolaryngology. Uh, he has chaired committees on ethics, research, research liaison and development, and was a member of the board of directors uh, of the AAO HNS. Dr. Uh, Weimuller, current activities include medical and surgical management of chronic sinusitis and associate administrator for surgery at UW Medical Center. Dr. Weimuller. Thank you for that uh, kind of uh, introduction. <laughs> you just have to spend a lot of time and rack up all of those different things. And, um, I am delighted to be able to present uh, the topic of quality of life investigation to an audience that's probably a far more receptive than my usual audience, which is a bunch of hard-headed surgeons. So uh, again, thank you for the invitation. And it, it, what happened uh, was that after receiving the invitation, I took it as an opportunity to go back and really look over how this whole thing has evolved. And that's what I'd like to present to you as sort of a historical um, review and uh, during that also talk about a number of topics uh, in quality of life. <coughs> the UWQOL project actually began in the late 1980s when I decided to pursue the area of quality of life issues in head and neck cancer. Uh, and by 1991, working with a, then a medical student here at UW, we validated a head and neck cancer specific instrument, which is the UW QOL. Uh, in 93, we initiated prospective data collection with the great assistance from Mark Coltrera, who's still on our faculty and who created the database that supported all of this. By 1998, we had uh, accumulated 550 prospectively followed uh, cases of head and neck cancer that had been given uh, QOL, this QOL test over the course of their treatment. In 2001, because there, were a lot of, there was a lot of interest in QOL emerging around the world as we were doing it here, uh, we uh, were responsible for getting a grant from NCI and convened an international head and neck QOL conference to try and coordinate the evolution of QOL research in, uh, in the area of head and neck cancer. And Bevan Yu was uh, on faculty then and is now chair at the University of Minnesota, um, and he was co-PI on <coughs> that effort. I'm delighted to tell you that as of 2012, this instrument, which started here, has been validated and translated into multiple languages, is used on most of the continents, and also uh, became the uh, head and neck QOL instrument for the British National uh, Cancer Database. So it's being widely used, and that's one of the most pleasing things for me uh, as, I, as I look back on all of this. 
I'm going to cover these different topics, why do this, define and describe QOL, measuring it, some basis, basic tenets of QOL research, lessons we've learned from this project, some comments about translation of QOL instruments and real-time use of QOL. <clears throat> so as a surgeon, it's pretty readily obvious when you do head and neck cancer surgery and you resect the mandible or the tongue or the larynx uh, that you're going to create obvious functional deficits. And the real driver here as a surgeon was we were doing these things and I mean the only thing that really gave you sustenance was often you could cure the patient and they overcame the deficits. But we wanted to learn um, more about this um, and that's what dro drove it. This is data from Andy Trotti, who's a radi radiation therapist that presented this particular graph and study at one of the international meetings. And basically what it shows is the toxicity over time, the increase in toxicity of radiation and chemo radiation regimens that are used to treat head and neck cancer. So again, the yellow bar is the, is, uh, the toxicity of these uh, treatment regimens and you can see over time that they are rapidly increasing and dramatically increasing. One of our residents <clears throat> during his stay here used the SEER database to look at questions, uh, uh, the reflections of um, the intensified treatment. And one of the things that he documented was a significant increase in difficulty of swallowing related to intensification of radiation and chemo radiation uh, treatment for head and neck cancer. So this is uh, a graph from his paper documenting that. Another one of our residents, uh, again looking at the SEER uh, inf information, uh, showed that there's a high suicide rate among head and neck cancer patients. So you see here that the U.S. population frequency of suicide in 100,000 person years is about 16. The overall cancer population in SEER is double that, and as you see, head and neck cancer is even higher than that. So uh, it has a significant impact uh, as, as demonstrated that way. <clears throat> So the motivation was that there's increasing use of toxic regimens, but no accompanying change in the survival of those patients. Also, at that point in time, quality of life was basically not being measured. The endpoints were mortality and mor some morbidity, but quality of life was really not even being addressed. So the, one of the driving theses of this whole work is if the survival is unchanged, uh, should we be selecting which regimen actually has the least negative impact on the patient? Would we choose surgery or radiation or chemo in the different settings uh, in treating head and neck cancer? So I'm going to spend some time here uh, about the definition and description of quality of life. It's hard to de define really, but this is, I think is a reasonable one, a patient's appraisal and satisfaction with their current level of functioning as compared to what they perceive to be possible or the ideal. And this is a photograph I took down on Pioneer Square during my years here at uh, Harborview, one of the, you all know patients like this who appear here. It's a multi-dimensional construct without a universally accepted definition, but uh, this uh, Dolly uh, piece demonstrates the to me, uh, the multiplicity of personality and, and uh, things that might play into quality of life. It varies over time. So most times when you study quality of life issues, you need to have an instrument that is effective in, in uh, measuring quality of life over time. It's ideally assessed by sequential measurement. And Kalman is an author who pointed out the gap, i.e. you can see the upper line is the ideal and the lower line is the fluctuations on a day-to-day -day basis of a person's expression of their quality of life. So you might catch them at a high point or a low point and you need to study them over, over time. <clears throat> Some of my surgical colleagues back in the 1990s said to me very directly, why in the heck are you studying quality of life? We've got to learn more about cancer genetics and the impact of treatment and all. Um, and besides, it's subjective and you can't measure it. Um, and I, my, one of my answers is that we do it every day. Audiograms, vision tests, depression index are all really numeric measures of subjective events. So our challenge wasn't that we couldn't do it, we just had to create a valid and reliable tool. 
Uh, Lord Kelvin, back in the 19th century, said, when you measure what you are speaking about it about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. And it was heartening to see that. <clears throat> we learned that uh, certainly measuring QL accurately uh, requires a response from the patient. There's a very poor correlation, typically, between the patient's expression of their quality of life and what the perception of their quality of life is from a provider um, or from a caregiver or even a family member. And also, uh, as we moved, as we did the translations and that sort of stuff, it was clear that there is quite a bit of cultural variability, even within our own society. Uh, and so we have to validate the instruments separately in each culture. QOL is uh, measured w typically with an instrument that covers a, a, a large number of areas that embrace functional, physical, psychological, and social issues. And uh, there are any number of QOL type instruments that can be categorized in three general groups. There are general or global quality of life instruments that are multifactorial and cover um, all of these uh, quite thoroughly. More narrowly, there are health-related quality of life instruments that review uh, the, the QOL impact of health conditions like high blood pressure or diabetes or something of that sort. And then there are disease-specific quality of life instruments, which is what I'm talking about. UWQOL is directed at head and neck cancer patients. <clears throat> so it measures the impact of that particular illness on the patient. Um, it is definitely in the category of a disease-specific quality of life instrument. When we go to evaluate a new instrument, we have to determine its validity, its reliability, and its responsiveness. In the category of, of validity, there are three subsets, a content, criterion, and construct validity. And the one that seems to resonate the most for us, at least in, in working in, in the field that I'm in, uh, is the construct validity. Does the scale behave the way the investigator hypothesizes? We are looking for an instrument that reacts when we do things uh, in treating the patient. Reliability, uh, do the repeated administrations of the test at short intervals in time yield similar results? So the measure of that is test, test, reliability. Um, and then do the questions in the instrument correlate with one another? Is there internal consistency? And there is a measure for that that's uh, reflected by the Chrome Box Alpha in, in this instance. <clears throat> and then, to me, most importantly, is the instrument sensitive to clinical change? Is it responsive as the patient goes through treatment? If there's clinical worsening or improvement, will the scale detect it? And again, that's a critical quality for an instrument that you're going to use over longitudinal uh, studies. <clears throat> so the global instruments uh, are generally less sensitive to things like treatment-related effects. So you've, you're measuring things that are somewhat, somewhat more vague as they relate to a particular kind of treatment. Uh, but as you get to the more disease-specific uh, instruments, they tend to be much more sensitive to treatment-related effects. So just keep that statement in mind, and I'll show you what I mean as, as uh, we go through this. QOL studies tend to be biased toward the best patients, which is something important to keep in mind as you try to generalize the results of a prospective trial to community use. Uh, but the studies tend to lack information from non-survivors. They're gone. They can't inform you about their quality of life. And many of the survivors with poor quality of life don't respond or are not available to provide the information. We treat patients from the whammy area. We might do a laryngectomy on somebody from Sitka and send them back, and we more or less lose contact about their long-term quality of life. <clears throat> and uh, this particular issue is, is particularly true if you try to do a cross-sectional study at a particular um, moment in time. Clinical trials tend to underestimate toxic effects. Um, so when you're constructing a, a clinical trial to compare, say, radiation to chemo radiation, and you uh, initiate the process, you have to have criteria for which the patient is excluded from the trial. If they have severe diabetes, 
or they have some other major medical comorbidity, they might be excluded from the trial. But once that trial is completed and the particular treatment is supported in the community, all of a sudden that treatment is applied to all comers. And so you then bring in all of these patients with elevated um, com comorbidities typically, and overall you get a worse quality of life using the same form of treatment that appeared to have a better quality of life in a prospective randomized trial. <clears throat> Humans, all of us, tend to seek life satisfaction, and what we have found is that post-treatment quality of life will improve over time, even in the face of severe functional deficits. Most people have a drive to just be better, uh, and we see that in uh, patients that are really severely compromised by various forms of treatment. So they tend uh, to reflect a better QOL over time just because they've made it through treatment and they're working to improve their own QOL. One of the um, uh, highly referenced studies in this arena in our field was done by Marcy List in Chicago, and she showed very clearly um, in retrospective studies, that the, I'm sorry, in prospective studies, patients thinking ahead, would they prioritize living or would they prioritize their quality of life? And quite strikingly, the patients always choose living over quality of life. So that's the most fundamental priority for most people. Looking at our own project, as I told you, uh, we have 550 patients prospectively assessed, meaning they had a quality of life uh, test, they completed it prior to the initiation of any treatment for their head and neck cancer. This is far and away the biggest series that's available in the world uh, uh, done this way in this particular field. Sammy Hassan, as I mentioned to you, was a UW medical student when we got started with the validation. Mark Coltrera created the UW Head and Neck Database, which is now the database for the uh, American Head and Neck Society and is being utilized internationally. He's, he did an incredible job creating that. Um, we had consultations with members of uh, the School of Public Health here to learn more about um, analytical analytics of, of this uh, study. And uh, during his tenure, uh, President Gerberding had a university initiatives fund uh, and we could submit, uh, anyone was welcome to submit, and we submitted uh, for a grant and got $250,000 to support a four-year data collection. So the thing that underpins this throughout is the environment that we live in. I mean, this could, I, I can't imagine doing this without being at a place like the University of Washington with all of these kind of people to, to work with, including the critical financial support to hire a data manager so that we could collect 550 prospective cases and follow them. Here are the domains that uh, are part of the UW QOL, and you can see in particular on, on your right issues of chewing and saliva and shoulder function because we do radical neck dissections that affect the spinal accessory nerve, speech, swallowing, taste. Those are all things that are pretty narrowly specific to the kind of patients that we're treating. Others are more general, appearance and activity, and you know, all the ones that are listed there reflect the more global or general things that might be in quality of life studies of, of other sorts. So it's a blend of more general and more specific issues. <clears throat> and to remind you uh, of those criteria that I mentioned earlier, I'll show you that the UWQOL does meet the psychometric criteria. It behaves the way we would expect it to behave, and it's sensitive to clinical change. So here is um, a graph showing the QOL, oh, I went forward unintentionally, the QOL outcome by cancer stage. And so at the top is stage one, and at the bottom is stage four, and on this side is the pre-treatment QOL, and then you can see uh, in three months after they've gone through either surgery or radiation or a combination, their QOL drops. And then as they recover by month 12, they have started to come back. The ones who have early cancer to stage one come back to a normal quality of life because they've had a small procedure of some sort, gotten rid of their cancer, and their quality of life comes back. If you look at the other end, the ones with the T4, stage four cancers, they never recover their quality of life fully because they've gone through intensive treatment. They may have had 
really significant surgery and radiation. And so this fits with what we see every day in the clinic. The outcomes vary to some degree by the specific site with patients who's, who have laryngeal cancer overall doing better than patients who have oral cancer, the ones who do worse are the ones who have hypopharyngeal cancer, upper esophagus, that sort of thing. Um, and what we learned about this, you will see some later, but turns out that among all the different things that occur as a result of our treatment, the one that has the greatest impact is difficulty swallowing, uh, which might be a surprise to some folks, but that's the thing that actually has the most profound effect on patients' quality of life in this particular group. Another thing that became obvious is what I call the domain cancellation effect. There are other ways to express this, but what you're looking at here, the various colored lines represent each of the different domains it, that comprise the UWQOL. And on this side, if you average them in the pre-op patients, their QOL score zero to 100, with 100 being the best, was 82. And then they go through treatment and you see that um, starting at the top, this is the shoulder domain, people all come in with a normal shoulder function. But if you do a radical neck dissection on them, they're gonna have some symptoms and their shoulder-related QOL is gonna go down. Um, at the other end is, is anxiety. And the patients have been told they have cancer, they're confronting aggressive treatment, their anxiety score is really poor, and they go through treatment and actually they're better off with respect to the anxiety component of their quality of life. So there, things are moving in both directions, and there's a blunting effect. So the overall UWQOL doesn't change as much as the components that make it up. So um, I concluded that the total score, to some degree, masks the functional change that's actually going on when the patients are being treat treated. Uh, and <clears throat> I think if we were gonna use QOL things to study the toxicity of a particular treatment, we have to narrow it down even lower than a, than a disease-specific QOL and study domain-specific, like swallowing and speech and the particular components if we're really going to understand uh, what's happening to these patients. And what has happened over time is that now function-specific QOL instruments are available for speech and swallowing and shoulder function and that sort of thing. Another thing we learned is that even though a patient's swallowing well, it may not really be a, a very nutritious diet. It could mean that they're only taking Ensure. Another uh, physician at Vanderbilt found that although patients were swallowing okay, they were eating the wrong things. And so <clears throat> their nutrition was poor, uh, typically made up of fat, caffeine, and alcohol instead of vegetables and the other things we would hope that they would be eating. Poor swallowing doesn't always equate to poor quality of life. This is a patient of mine that sent me this uh, just so I would be, you know, get a chuckle out of his insure bag that he has hooked up to his Harley. <clears throat> this is an interesting thing. I, I told you uh, before that quality of life was not being used to study uh, in the early 90s. In our laryngectomy group, the question was asked, are you the same, better, or worse? And 90% of the patients who had had a laryngectomy indicate that they are either the same or better than pretreatment. <clears throat> and the quality of life actually is most associated in those patients with activity and recreation, not with their loss of speech, which is a surprise to us and I'm sure to you. But it highlights the importance of a patient-specific response about quality of life. We wouldn't have predicted that. Um, and it also is helping to overcome the natural bias against laryngectomy. Nobody wants to take somebody's larynx out. But the national data about chemo radiation is showing that among all of the cancers, breast and prostate and all that, laryngeal cancer is one of the ones where the survival is going down instead of up. And it's because pe people naturally opt for a non-surgical approach. They don't want their larynx taken out. The data is now showing that their survival is worse, and we can tell them now you'll do better from a survival standpoint and do fine with a QOL standpoint because we have the data to show it. <clears throat> depression is a big factor. You saw the thing about suicide. Uh, there is a high incidence of depression in our patients and obviously depression can affect their compliance with aggressive treatment regimens of one sort or another. 
and it predisposes them to suicide. Another one of our residents, Sophia Morrow, did a project where she compared the results of the PHQ uh, depression index with the UWQOL, and what you see here is there is a high correlation between poor quality of life and high depression. So the conclusions at this point is that the UWQOL instrument is sensitive to treatment-induced change by both site and by stage, that the domains reflect the treatment effects, and that low quality of life is clearly associated with depression. <clears throat> it's expensive to do these kind of studies. If you're going to embark on something like this, you need to assure that you have funding, and you need to have funding that's going to last for a long time in order to accumulate meaningful data. In this group of patients, more than 50% of those with advanced cancer died within two years and were unable to participate in the study. <clears throat> so in terms of recommendations, uh, the things that I learned is that you need to create a tightly defined study group with one or two specific study questions. You need to pick an instrument that is re reflects the question uh, that you're trying to address. You need to anticipate a significant dropout rate in your power calculations. You need to limit the time frame of the study. The longer it is, the harder it is to do. And you need to ensure adequate funding. <coughs> we learned some interesting things when translation was un uh, undertaken. It is a very complex process. You have to assure that the instrument is valid in the new language. And there are nuances in meaning uh, in different cultural perspectives. I'll mention a couple. But to do it, you have to do a forward translation from the English to the non-English, ideally by two bicultural experts. A third expert has to compare the translations and assess for differences, and those have to be resolved. Then a separate set of instruments should back-translate the instrument into English to make sure that there's forward-backward agreement uh, before you take the instrument out and, and use it to test patients. <clears throat> so that's a complex process. After translation, you would administer it to the native population and then again test it like we did for validity, reliability, and responsiveness and redesign it if necessary. So for all of those languages that I showed you, that's been done. For those, and they're, they're, each one has been reported in the literature as a study. Here are some of the things that we found. In Japanese, there is a poor distinction between the words fair and good. So we have each one of those domains has a five-part thing that goes from very good to very poor in one way or another. And the distinction between fair and poor in Japanese was hard to make. In the Swahili and Mandarin Chinese languages, there's no clear way that the people who knew the language could describe the word narcotic. And one of our questions in the pain domain is, are you using narcotics to control your pain, which is a marker for a pretty high level of pain. <clears throat> Sophie Omuro was over in Kenya. She's originally from Kenya, and as a resident, she went over there for a project. And this was an interesting bit of information that emerged. Um, as I told you, in advanced head and cancer in the United States, the major determinant for quality of life is the patient's ability to swallow. If they can't swallow, they become socially isolated uh, because eating is such a big part of how we socialize with people. In Kenya, the major quality of life issue turns out to be speech. The Kenyan diet is dominated by soft, solid food and is easy to swallow, so they don't have as much trouble eating what they consider a normal diet, even though they're having some dysphagia. Because of the setting there, with that's not as sophisticated as ours, uh, often the patients receive a tracheotomy early in their management because head and neck cancers often cause airway trouble. But very few of the patients are literate. They can't write and they can't speak when they get a trach. So it creates social isolation. So again, it's the so social isolation. In the US, it's swallowing that makes social isolation. In Kenya, it's your airway that creates social isolation. And the result of that was some consideration for altering the form of management for head and neck cancer in Kenya to try and help the patients uh, with that particular issue. So this is where we are now with head and neck cancer in the, in the United States. It's, uh, we are not using quality of life instruments effectively in active patient care, and I would love to see us be doing, being, doing better in that. 
So we want to move from passive, i.e. research study use of QOL instruments into uh, active application. Um, because I, I think that we could improve patient management, identifying uh, health problems during and after treatment, and monitor symptoms that might allow us to better actually identify early uh, recurrences. Um, <clears throat> it is an efficient screening tool. Ours is 10 questions. It could be used either in the clinic or by mail to identify things as I've shown you. If, if you see significant change, you might be concerned about depression, dysphagia, chewing difficulties. One of our colleagues over uh, in Nottingham, uh, Simon Rogers, actually actively uses UWQL this way and his group has created a touch screen so the patient comes into the clinic and they can hit a touch screen and they immediately know what their QOL score is as they see the patient in clinic. Um, it was, it, he found it to be very uh, acceptable for non-computer user patients and preferred over paper. So uh, that really represents a significant opportunity. Um, this is some data from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, deals with patients who are under palliative uh, chemotherapy for cancer. Ten, patient, ten physicians were randomized to receive or not receive quality of life information using the EROTC um, uh, instrument. The outcome was that quality of life information increased the identification of moderate to severe health problems at a, at a highly uh, statistically significant rate. Um, all of the MDs and 87% of the patients believed that using the QOL tool improved communication uh, between the physician and the patient. So I think there are opportunities to improve uh, head and neck research trials by measuring toxicity with QOL instruments and uh, very importantly an opportunity to improve patient care with real-time QOL assessment and uh, targeted intervention. So, thank you very much for your attention. We have a few minutes for questions and answers and that sort of thing. Yeah. I discovered that QOL over time in the four stages of cancer, the only one that didn't get a balance was stage two, which seems somewhat counterintuitive. Do you have thoughts on that? <clears throat> a, a bounce up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, well, stage two and stage three actually clinically are, are kind of similar to one another, and it doesn't surprise me that, that they are more like the stage three than the stage two. I don't have any better answer than that. I'm, I'm not quite sure what that, uh, what that reflects more than that, that they're pretty similar. Yeah. Um, these guys, have you ever, so you, it sounds like you have anxiety and depression within the instrument. Have you ever drawn a line, say, with people with high anxiety or depression scores? Because you, you think what you might see is sort of everyone starts similarly, but like the, the people with low anxiety and depression might look like your TNM stage one longitudinally, and the high anxiety and depression would look more like your TNM stage four. Or, yeah, have, you, have you done that? Well, actually, there's a paper from our department that doesn't relate to um, head and neck cancer, but it relates to sinus disease. And it's exactly what you say, that the patients, they're like parallel lines. If you follow their quality of life or their functional scores, the p patients with depressive tendencies come in with a lower quality of life score and, and have a, a certain uh, improvement as they go through sinus treatment. Patients without that have the same kind of improvement, but they start at a higher or, or better functional uh, setting. So the, the, the lines parallel one. And I, we haven't done that, but I would guess that that's exactly what would happen here. Yeah, yeah, I was sure. struck by two things. One was the validation of one of the original principles that we need to measure stuff to learn about it, and your, your discovery, really, that uh, doing the laryngectomy, which you were surprised to learn, couldn't affect quality of life of people, could apply to most of Yep. Uh, and that, that the later emerging, I guess, data that um, that was a more effective treatment, uh, surgical treatment as opposed to the others, it really affected, it sounds like, the, the course of selection of treatment. For it's getting there. Uh, it, it's still, well, yeah, it is. Running it upstream mm -hmm. against the cultural yeah, bias. Yeah, yeah, there's still a big bias towards non-surgical management and advanced head and neck cancer, but it's, it, it is becoming now, I think, more accepted that 
there's a very particular subset of that group of patients that's clearly much better treated surgically than with radiation. I see Mark in the back of the room. Mark, do you have any kind of this Mark Coltrera back there who was a major player in getting this all done, so. <laughs> Thanks for all you did. The other observation I had, a comment was about, I think you talked, referred to Marcy List yes. study that yes. showed a preference for survival as opposed to falling blood. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, and that ran very counter to my experience. At some point, and I wonder what the age rate of those patients was, we very much see the opposite emerging. Uh, in older people, regardless of whatever the condition may be, uh, you will see a much more high preference for quality of life than survival when you get to a certain level. And Good point. I'm really Can interested that that seemed not to be the case, and I suspect it relates to the... the uh, yeah, this patient the, population is uh, largely between the ages of 50 and 65. Yeah, so they're, they're young enough that yeah. that would be the usual yes. outcome. Yeah. I just saw my 98-year-old aunt last week, and I just had a birthday, and I can tell you for about 15 years, you would have been happy to join my uncle. Um, <coughs> yeah, but yeah. that's a point well taken, and uh, we haven't, to my knowledge, I haven't seen a study that breaks this down according to age, mm -hmm. um, but point well taken. Yeah. Yeah. We, have any, we have people listening and watching at the university. Do we have any questions for you? Other questions for Dr. Wendell? Well, thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it. <laughs>